I'm Bob and I like to make stuff. Today we're going to teach Josh how to weld and make a holder for scrap metal out of scrap metal. Not too long ago we rearranged a bunch of stuff in the shop, especially the metal working area, and one of the things that that revealed is that I have a huge amount of metal scrap that I have to figure out something to do with. I've got a bunch of small pieces like this, but I've also got a bunch of taller pieces in the corner. So today I thought I would take the chance to make a really simple first welding project. And in fact, we're gonna use it to teach Josh how to MIG weld. The idea here is to make one of those storage units like you would see at one of the big box stores. So you've got metal in the back that's kind of tall and then slightly shorter stuff in the front. And then we're also gonna have a section on the bottom for really short pieces because I kind of hang on to those too. This is gonna go over here in the corner. For the project, I'm gonna use all scrap square tubing that I've already got here. So I'm gonna cut this down and get all the pieces ready. Then we'll get Josh in here and teach him how to weld. I'm using the bandsaw to cut these pieces off, but you could totally use an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel. It would do the same thing. It might actually be faster as well. You could also use that angle grinder with a grinding disc or a flap disc to add a chamfer to each one of these corners because that's gonna be good for welding. I'm gonna do that on my belt grinder just because I have it, but an angle grinder would work just fine. We got all those pieces cut down and I went ahead and added the chamfer to the end. The reason for that is because the square tubing already kind of has a chamfer on it. Since we're doing butt joints like this, the two pieces together create a little valley. We're gonna fill up that valley with the molten metal and that'll help get good penetration on this weld and it'll be nice and strong. Now, Josh wants to learn how to weld. He understands how it works, but he's never actually done it. So we're gonna talk through the process as if he knows nothing about it to maybe help you and anybody else learn a little bit about welding. If you wanna know all the details and all of the precise information, you should definitely check out Jody Collier from Welding Tips and Tricks. And there's a bunch of other YouTube channels that specialize in this stuff. So we're gonna give kind of a high level overview so that he can get welding. Uh, let's get started. This is a fairly standard MIG welder. I'm not sponsored by them or anything. It's just the one I picked up. This one is running on 220, so it's more powerful than what you would get on a 110. Either one will work. I'm using a gas back here, so I have to make sure that that tank is turned on so there's gas running to the machine. And the only controls you have here are the feed at which the wire comes out of the torch. That's this little welding wire right here. And then the amount of voltage that's running through this torch to your work surface. Now to complete the circuit, you have a welding clamp this is a ground clamp and it's gonna go on the metal that you're working on. I'm working on a metal table, so I just ground the entire table. So now when you put two pieces together and you pull the torch, you're gonna to create an arc of electricity from here to the workpiece, and that's so hot that it starts to melt the material. Once you melt those two pieces of material, when they cool down, they fuse into one. There's also some wire in here that's fed out through that speed control that I mentioned, and that fills in the gap in the material and helps fill it in and make a strong weld. If you have flux core welding, it's basically the same process, but instead of gas coming out of the torch as well, there's a liquid flux inside that wire that also helps to shield the arc being created from here to the workpiece. That's super brief, uh, maybe high level. Hopefully it's all true, but that's basically the premise for MIG welding. With the machine on, when you pull the trigger, you're gonna hear gas come out and you'll see the wire come out. So that's everything that you need right there. And when you change that speed control on the welder, you're changing the speed at which this wire feeds out. And there's a lot of variables as to why you would change that, make it faster or slower. Usually it has to do with how quickly your hand is gonna be moving along the given weld. What if I were just to take this and go real far back and like beep, 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 beep. It wouldn't work because the shielding gas is gonna be coming out right here and it's not gonna to be touching down uh, here. So it's not gonna flood the area to give right. it the option. The, the arc is happening from right here to the workpiece and the gas would all be back here blown out. So if you work in a windy area, mm -hmm. you need to shield this because the wind will blow that gas out even if it's really close and it won't do the job. So how do you know how much wire needs to be sticking out of the gun? Usually the stick out, it depends on the given weld that you're doing, but probably quarter inch to three eighths of an inch is safe. You also have a tip in here that you can kind of screw in and out and move that in and out. This is super dirty, so that's not ideal. Then you've also got this outer piece that you can move um, that will kind of change where the gas comes out in relation to all three of these parts, basically. Like a nozzle. 
Yeah, it's a nozzle. Yeah. This is the contact tip. This is basically a consumable. Eventually they start to get gross and broken down. So we're gonna replace it with one of these new ones. And the wire comes through this little tip. This tip gets screwed in on the inside of the torch. So once you've got the machine turned on, the wire fed, the gas on, all that stuff, then it's time to actually start welding. And you're gonna put this piece down here. If we're gonna weld that joint right there, you wanna start straight up and down and then roll over maybe 10 or 15 degrees. It's all gonna be dependent on the particular weld that you're doing. And then as soon as you start pressing the trigger here, you're gonna arc from this point down to the metal. So you don't want it to be touching. You want it to be off a little bit. An arc will be created between those two things and you're gonna start moving it back. And the pattern at which you move it depends on the pattern of the final weld. I do a little kind of back and forth, little C shapes but there's all sorts of different variations and a professional welder will have something that they prefer as far as uh, what shape to do for this type of weld. But before you do that, before you pull this trigger, you need to be wearing the right safety gear. You need to have an auto darkening mask and some welding gloves and probably cotton clothing. You don't want to wear anything polyester because any of those sparks that pop off could set it on fire. You don't want that. Before we get to worrying about this actual joint, we're gonna take a single piece of scrap and just try to make a little bead along here. So he's gonna put the welder down here, pull the trigger and start moving it back and forth a little bit. And we wanna listen for basically the sound of frying bacon. You want a consistent kind of crackling sound. That's gonna give you a good weld. Uh, Jimmy Duresta told me this morning that if you have an inconsistent sound, you're gonna have an inconsistent weld. And that's a really good way to look at it. So you want crackling bacon from when you start to when you stop. All right, I'm ready to do the test bead, but I'm trying to maneuver this. Do I push or do I pull it? Everybody that I've listened to has a different answer for that question, and I think it honestly depends on the thing that you're trying to weld. So in this case, I would do whatever's comfortable so that you start to understand how to weld, and then as you get into more technical instances of it, you can figure out which one works best for that particular case. You ready? They're crackling, mm -hmm. and then I touch it. Yeah. And I shouldn't touch it, right? Right. So see how much is stuck out here too? Yep. We may need to turn the feed down a little bit so it's not coming out as fast, okay. because that's gonna wanna interrupt. It's gonna wanna run into the metal Yeah, because that's more. what it, it felt like. Right. It felt like I was being so impeded. You could, you could do that a couple different ways. You can cut this down, or you can move your hand faster. Okay. Well, you actually should go slower than fast. Okay, so that's taking the knob. So that's that taking down. the wire feed. We're gonna take it down to a three from a five. When you're holding it, you may wanna rest your hand or hold the, the tip of it so that you've got more control. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh yeah, see how it burned through? Why did that happen? Because you know, you're know you slowing down because you know the end is coming up, so you yeah. just spent more time there and it got oh, hotter. Yeah. Now also, we'll sometimes use this as a pivot point, so that W or that C is resting on my finger instead of okay. trying to hold it like this, kind of resting. But you don't necessarily need to hold it. Having a little thing okay. helps. Yeah, moving close. Slow down. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. In this piece that we're gonna connect, tack welding is doing like a, a small spot, like a temporary like right. CA glue before you do all of it. Because if you were to weld this one part, it would bend? Yeah, if you put a whole bunch of heat on one part of this joint, it's gonna warp and so it's gonna end up lifting like this and you don't want that. So you put a tack here and then a tack on the inside and then on that side and it locks everything relationally together and then you go back and fill in those welds so it's strong. Holy crap, that's what we worked. In this case, it doesn't really matter, but you would want to flip over and at least put one there so that it, you don't run the risk of it like folding in either direction. So with a bigger project, a lot of things to consider though, like if I'm looking at this, is how it's physically going to be oriented. Yeah. Because you gotta like get up in to yep. stuff. Which is part of why you wanna have like a welding surface that is grounded. Yeah. That way as long as any part of this is touching this table, it's grounded. You don't have to worry about placement as much. You can stand something up and weld here or whatever. All right, so now that he has a basic understanding of MIG welding, we're gonna lay out some of these other pieces and start to add joints to them. I'll give you an update once we get some of the frames put together. I think metal is together with other pieces of metal. Yep. This is not intro to printing welding, it's intro Man. to welding.
So it's, it's definitely a trick between going too slow and burning through it, but then just like purposely overlapping and yeah. making progress. I feel like there's a 3D printing analog to this, and there's not. No, that would be TIG, where you, okay. you create this same situation, <clears throat> and then you take the filler rod, and you stick it in there yeah. to fill the gap. Because I have a tiny bit of experience with TIG. Right. And so the idea that you're, you're creating and pushing a puddle along, I have to untrain, which is like the academic knowledge I have of watching people do it. I go, yeah, they're doing that like a 3D printer moves. Right. And that underlying academic assumption is wrong. And so I have to get over that. I've got our four frames laid out here on the table. I'm using some magnets to hold them in place. Now these are gonna get connected with a piece of angle iron. So I'm gonna put this right down in here and make sure that it's touching both sides of each one of these frames. Get this in place and I'll tack that in and then do the same thing up here on the top and then add some other cross pieces on the back just to turn this entire thing into one big structure. This is where we're at. We've got basically the structure put together and it is super ugly. Part of that is due to the fact that it's all mixed match material. I'm using whatever I have here left over from old projects. So there's a lot of really different stuff happening. But luckily this thing does not have to be pretty. This is definitely a utility piece that's gonna sit right over there and just hold all the scrap. So the next step is to use some of this also leftover expanded steel sheet. We're gonna cut these down and fit them on the back of each one of these sections to stop the pieces from falling down in between them. All right, this is where we're at. I've patchworked together a bunch of scrap pieces to make this thing work. I've got most of the areas covered with the expanded steel. Now I've just got a couple of pieces of angle that we're gonna weld on to kind of cover up that exposed edge. Now Josh is gonna weld these on, then he's gonna go back and grind some of this top surface so it doesn't look quite as bad. Then I'm gonna make some tool hangers to go in the front of it and we will be done. Now, grinding a lot of these welds serves no purpose. Um, it's just practice because a lot of them are like bulging over the ends and you're not gonna be able to get that perfectly flat because they don't line up anyway. But I'm just trying to get a feel for the grinder, like what angle to aggressively go at it and then like a more shallow angle to smooth it over. So I'm just practicing. It's not gonna get any prettier. I just wanna figure out how to do it. All right, this thing is pretty much done. Quick and dirty, kind of ugly, but it's gonna serve its purpose well, which means we need to move it into place and get this place cleaned up. All right, here it is. It's a really simple project, but it made a big difference in helping us organize the scrap and keep some of the tools in order. And like I mentioned before, something like this doesn't have to be pretty. It needs to be strong and functional. Any thoughts on first time welding? Welding was really fun. I went from burning holes and stuff to sticking two pieces of metal together pretty decently within about an hour. So now I can make like metal bases for tables and a whole bunch of other things that I didn't think I could do beforehand. So thank you for that. Sure. It just goes to prove that it's really not that difficult. You can learn with a little bit of time and instruction and don't be afraid of it. That's the big thing. I think a lot of people are afraid of welding. Like it's really dangerous. It's really difficult. 
like everything else, it takes practice. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, we would love to hear about it down in the comments. And of course, a lot of you probably have welding suggestions, tips and tricks. Leave those down there as well to help us and everybody else watching this video. We've got tons of other types of projects that you may want to check out. And if you're not subscribed, be sure to do that as well. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. So the idea here, so the idea here, <laughs> hopefully it's all true, but that's basically the premise for MIG welding. I specifically like the hope it's all true. <laughs> it's not terrible. I, I keep changing it. I have to the sneeze and I'm holding it Achoo! and I'm dying. That's a flute. Ooh. Ooh. I have scrap metal. <laughs>